Hi everyone, thanks for joining us again for this week's Wellness Wednesday with the Wichita Symphony. We have a really cool little short um, offering for you today. Joining me is our principal horn player, Jeb Wallace, and our music director, Daniel Hege, and Tiffany Rhodes, Tiffany Bell Rhodes, who is now the manager of education and community partners, partnership. Did I get that right, Tiffany? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, so today we're kind of we're focusing on something that I'd never heard of before, and it, the word sounds kind of exotic and terrifying at the same time. It's phenomenology, and that's something that Jeb studied and gave a doctoral dissertation on. And so to get into that kind of process, that kind of concept, I, I found a really cool metaphor. So in the in the spirit of wellness and taking care of yourself and and all of that. Um, we're told to drink a lot of water when we're stressed and, and just to stay healthy, 11 cups a day, which is a lot. And so I found myself drinking like four cups and thinking, this is really awful. I'm just chugging cups of water and I'm not enjoying it. And somebody said, well, why don't you add lemon or mint or something so that it, at least you can enjoy the flavor? And that kind of clicked for me. Um, when we think about music and adding that into our lives in a therapeutical sense, music can be great for anxiety. It's a great mood enhancer. It can relax us. But are you listening to it just to check those things off and going, great, now I'm relaxed? Or are you really listening to it and rolling your sleeves up, adding that lemon, adding that mint to kind of just enjoy it and let it saturate you just a little bit more? So we're going to dive into this phenomenology and by the end of this, you're going to hopefully be excited to explore new works and old works in a different way. So Jeb, can you tell us in a nutshell what phenomenology is? Yeah, thank you, Holly. Uh, yeah, phenomenology, it's a big word, but actually the meaning is quite simple. It's really the study of phenomena or the way that things appear to us in our own experiences. And so, um, when we're listening to music, um, either we're describing the sound itself, the way that um, it might have a surface or a temperature or a shape, uh, or we're describing the way that it impacts us in a subjective way. Um, and so this, this concept came about in the first half of the 20th century in philosophy with people like uh, Husserl and Heidinger, um, and sort of evolved into this tradition of really describing experiences of perceptions like thoughts and memories, imagination, uh, embodied action, and even social activity. And so all of our life experiences sort of help uh, to craft and shape the way that we experience art. And that's certainly no exception in music. That sounds like to me that what you are offering is permission really for listeners, just regular listeners that don't have any musical background to have an opinion or understand a sound any way they want. Absolutely, Holly. I think that's exactly the idea is to, to really own your own experience and to be open when you come to a concert and you hear either new sounds or familiar sounds and just to experience them in new ways. So you're really um, kind of inviting people to be vulnerable and to just let their imaginations go. You don't have to go into a concert and say, okay, I know because of the program notes that Beethoven lived from da 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 I don't even know the dates. Um, and this is a sonata allegro form. That's not it. What you're saying is this piece reminds me of the pancake breakfast I had when I was a kid. And that's the right answer. Or this piece sounds like maybe the dark, um, you know, moldy or not moldy, but mossy, um, floor of a forest and that's a right answer there are no wrong answers that is absolutely right holly and i think you know you're really onto the at the core of this it's about getting in, in touch with those sort of childlike impulses the enthusiasm that we have for for new experiences do you I mean, this is just a general question for all of you just a, a rapid fire answer do you think the general audience right now feels welcome to feel like this daniel uh, I think a lot of them do, um, I, but I do think that some people who who haven't experienced it, they want to know what they should be listening for and what the piece is about so that they can get a kind of a foothold into it. And so they 
they might come in open, but they they quickly want to channel it where they're supposed to. Mm. And I think that's what we want to get away from. Tiffany, what do you think? I guess the short answer would be, I hope so. <laughs> and I suppose if they don't, I hope that they will, because I think that this is the most exciting way to experience music, even for people who are trained in theory and other things. But to really have a subjective experience, I think is where we really get at the core of why we love music. I love that. Jeb, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's such a, um, again, personal thing. And so, you know, I know people that come to the concert hall and they read the program notes. And like you said, they want to understand the structure or the history. And those are really important elements. This is just that other part that you can't write about so much. It's, it's something that you invent for yourself. And again, like you said, be vulnerable, be open, and to just listen and, and really feel the music deeply. In your what you've written, you've given us a toolkit, which we're sharing with people. And I'm just going to give us um, some things to listen for. And then we're going to play a segment of your um, one of your performances. You say you ask, does the sound fill you up? Is it wet or dry? Is the sound transparent, translucent or opaque? Do you feel alone or with others? Do you sense conflict, community, triumph, resolution, despair? These are a couple things to think of. And I'll, I'll list some of the others uh, for the other piece that we're going to listen to. So why don't I hit play and we'll just try to listen to this for like 15 to 30 seconds or so and try to listen to it, not in like a musician kind of like this is a, you know, a particular form of music, but where does it take you and just allow that and we'll be vulnerable. We will be vulnerable. So here is the slow movement from the Schumann. to go first and and um, share what your your um, your experience listening to this just a few things well right away i i i kind of went into myself a little bit so uh in a good way um and i felt like it was very poetic it just had this poise and I, so i didn't have a very like specific thing that i thought of but it was just more of this feeling of going inside uh looking inward a little bit and Tiffany? The first thing that I was reminded of was really slowly waking up on like a Saturday morning when there's no alarm, but you're just like waking up really peacefully and naturally. And maybe you've even had a good dream. Ooh, it was I love very that. like very easy waking kind of feeling. That's cool. I love that. Um, for me, it, it sounded like young, um, teenagers kind of like in love, um, talking to each other, kind of like very intimate, um, saying just really sweet things to each other. Um, it felt, um, it felt dainty is the word that came up to my, to my mind. And I know that that is the right answer because it's my answer. Jeb, what do you think of how we're taking this? I think this is all just so wonderful to hear. Um, and, you know, having performed this piece on this, this particular recording and also been able to listen, it, you know, there is different perspectives that well up for me, but it really reminds me of the first time I held my first child, this kind of, there's two voices, the horn and the piano, and they're really close and they're kind of, they're, you know, working together in tandem, but there's also individual personalities present. I think um, one of the interesting things as we share what what our non-musical experiences are of this piece of music is the, um, the point of view gets bigger when, when we share with each other. To me, that's what makes it interesting is when, when I listen to Daniel and Tiffany and Jeb's um, view of this, it only expands the beauty of the piece. I appreciate it so much more. So it kind of builds community, if, if you will. And I, I hope that people um, take that in 
and intermissions and, and kind of share those thoughts. I, I want to just say I, I agree with that because I think when the rest of you spoke about it, I also could imagine that. And so it helps us to empathize with each other and where they're coming from and, and hearing that that's a very valid point of view from, from each of you and go, yeah, I, that would be like that for me too. I didn't you know, happen to say that, but uh, I can see it. And I think that's what's valuable about talking about it and building community that way. I love that. Another part of Jeb's um, toolkit for phenomenology is to describe in objective terms. And so he writes, does it have a smooth surface? Does it have a rough surface? Um, is a surface continuous through the piece or does it change? Does the sound have a shape? Is it angular, circular, complex, or simple? And does the sound have a density? Does the sound have a great amount of mass or volume? Or is the sound rather empty and free of mass or volume? So we're going to listen to the second movement and go through the same thing with that in mind with Jeb's toolkit. With those um, parts of the toolkit, let's start with Tiffany and see what 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 words come to mind for you. Uh, I immediately thought it felt really bouncy, and uh, to give an image to it, it really reminded me of my little puppy bounding around in the yard, like chasing a toy or a ball or something. I just could see a lot of like bouncing and joyfulness and big smiles. <laughs> I love that, Daniel. Well, it's just extremely active uh, and it's just abounding with energy. And so I kind of imagine even like a child, like running out into a meadow and just noticing so many things and running over here and then running over there and just kind of trying to absorb as many things as possible as quickly as possible. Because the, the range is explored and the, of course the articulation and it's the way it's jumping around in that bouncy way, uh, it's just has that kind of character for me. I, I kind of felt the same thing. I was thinking it, to me, it felt like a complex um, attention. My attention was complex listening to this. It was like all over the place trying to follow this, trying should I listen to the piano, should I listen to the horn? And bouncy is a word that I came up with as well. So that echoes that. Um, Jeb, what, what do you think? Yeah, these are all such wonderful ideas. I'm feeling the community, you guys. That's, this is such a great theme here. Um, yeah, for me, it was a lot of activity. I was on this particular listening, thinking about if I was out um, like in a city market shopping for um, like a party I was going to hold. And I was thinking about all the wonderful experiences of community that we would have. Um, and again, sort of with this kind of lightness in my step, um, just anticipation and youth and energy. So to wrap this up um, with your toolkit, you can take... Um, a point of view of listening, um, like for how it, how your experience was, or listening in objective terms, and then can you mix those together? Would that be like a, a goal for like a third listen of, of something, or you know, for the more? I would imagine you'd want to be practicing this intentionally. What do you think, Jeb? Yeah, I think you know that is sort of the idea. There are these two choices you have. You can uh, identify things that you hear in the music as a separate object or your own personal reactions. And so when we combine those together, then we get this really much fuller, uh, more uh, of a broader perspective on our listening experience. So that's exactly how I see it too, Holly. So thank you for that clarification. I, you know, I, I was thinking about that, uh, combining the two. And I was thinking, if you were trying to relate to someone else who was listening to the same thing you just heard, and you explain the personal side of it. This is how it makes me feel from a very subjective point of view. And they said, hmm, why do you feel that way? Then you could use the more objective parts of the music because it had this quality to it. It had this objective quality to it. And that's what made me think of this. And then that might be the bridge to someone else saying, oh, okay, because of those uh, elements in the music, I understand why you had that. And that's why I had my response. So. 
it could be like a bridge to have the objective part between two subjective points of view. I love that. Um, so I, I hope this is kind of all of us here. Our wish is for listeners not to feel any hesitancy or shame or any kind of like holding back of your feelings or of your view of any kind of peace, because your experience is yours and it's right. So I think we'll wrap this up. And um, at the end of this segment will be the entire Schumann. It's two movements that Jeb has shared. It is Jeb playing. And it'd be interesting if you feel compelled to share your thoughts, send it in on Facebook or send an email in. Um, and we're always interested in hearing what our listeners have to say. So thank you, Jeb, for sharing your your toolkit. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you, Tiffany, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Mm -hmm.